everybody, and welcome to another Darkest Dungeon mod overview. My name is Element5, and it has been some time since we last dipped a toe into the talented waters of the Darkest Dungeon Workshop, and in that time, many new and promising mods have surfaced in the community, all very worthy of our attention. And now that my throat has recovered from surgery, and my body is ready, it's time we jump right back into those waters with a look at one of the most requested mods I have received as of late, known as the Duchess. And in order to celebrate our return to the Hamlet and to thank the support of this community, the developers of Darkest Dungeon Red Hook Studios are generously sponsoring a community giveaway that I will be attaching to this video. Anybody can enter the raffle and I'll have more details on how to do so at the end of this video, but let's get into the good stuff here and begin to take a look at the new Queen of Blood. The victory. Perhaps the turning point. The Duchess is a gorgeous transformation class created by S Purple, a slightly startled seal, and an actual bird IRL. And if you've been paying any attention to the modding community, then you're familiar with the stellar quality of their work, and you've seen mods like the Cataphract, the Incandescent Whisperer boss, or Seal's massive standalone dungeon mod called the Sunward Isles. And this class is right up there in terms of mechanics. She has phenomenal animations, her transformation. She sort of slithers as she walks and really feels like playing something out of the Crimson Court. And while she's comparable to an abomination, her primary utility is to be sort of a leechy frontline tanky damage dealer with a focus on repost, crits, and self heal as she wields an inhuman appetite along with her trusty Joyeuse blade the same blade famously known to be wielded by Charlemagne. And while I found that she has real practical use in basically almost any group or dungeon, she is definitely specialized through both her lore and mechanics to rival the bloodsuckers that reside among the Hamlet and throughout the Crimson Court DLC. And this makes sense given her trinkets, her focus on repost, debuffing enemy healing received, as well as some of her direct mechanical interactions with Blood and the Crimson Curse. In fact, a special note added to the Steam page disclaimers that in order to get full functionality out of this mod, you'll want to make sure Crimson Court is enabled. It's also important to note that her crit buff is actually a self-heal, which is a part of why crit is so important to her design, and she does not virtue. She only has an affliction known as Ravenous, which comes with the trade-off of a ton of lost control added stress and damage to the party, similarly punishing to that of the Thrall's Affliction, and while Ravenous makes her less tanky and more prone to stress and damage, it also gives her the aid of a small crit buff and a huge buff to healing received, which can be kind of nice. Now, in terms of her backstory, her description on Steam reads, the Duchess is a powerful monster exiled from the Crimson Court who seeks aid from the Hamlet to usurp the court's nobility and allow her to take her rightful place as Queen of the Court. To that end, she'll fight alongside your heroes as a brilliant swordswoman or a ferocious monster. The choice is yours. And while there is no official comic strip on this class, S Purple was kind enough to share the rough mock-up that they had planned as her backstory, which showcases these four independent rows here detailing the long-standing rivalry that exists between the Countess and the Duchess. The first frame, reaching back all the way into their early childhoods, a depiction of the Duchess practicing fencing while the Countess is being led away by a handler. This second row showing a young adult Duchess being entirely secluded on a balcony looking out to the moon while the popular Countess is surrounded by a group of people. The third row showing a fully grown Duchess now lying on the floor of her manor after being infected by blood sent to her in an invitation by the Countess, and the last frame, the standoff between both parties, the Countess and Duchess in full transformation as the corpses of bloodsuckers lay around them. And we also have a look at what could have been one of her unique curio interactions accessible while taking her through the Crimson Court, which sadly just had too many conflicts to implement. So it's clear that there exists this long-standing rivalry between Countess and Duchess, the Countess issuing a final challenge to her sworn enemy, sending the Duchess an invitation to the Crimson Court similar to that which you receive in order to make your own way into the gate, 
complete with a vial of blood which triggers the Duchess's transformation into her own unique brand of bloodsucker, evening the playing field. And I found this very interesting. The headcanon, according to S. Purple, is that the mutation effects of the blood occur differently based on the region that it is used in. So, thus you get a bunch of insectoid bloodsuckers near and around the hamlet, larger creatures featured inside the court, while the Duchess's region resulted in a transformation of something more like that of a leech, explaining her own particular brand of bloodsucker. Unfortunate that we don't get to see that finished product of a comic strip explaining her backstory, but some really great resources here thanks to S. Purple, and a really nice picture of why she feels so good as a class that feels like it came right out of the Crimson Court. Now, before we break down all of her unique abilities and how her kit works, let's just do what we always do and take a snapshot at her stats and resistances. Max HP right off the bat here, pretty high for a Seeker character with no dodge or prot and four speed. So a slower frontline tankier class. Indeed, stats here not really that different than that of a man at arms. Uh, no accuracy, 4% crit, which is pretty moderate. This is just underneath, say, the crit of a grave robber. And then a d base damage of five to 10. We're getting a little bit of a buff here from the Cove Tactician. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to see that this class is really about being tanky and landing crits um, and feeling pretty slow until we ramp up her speed. And now in terms of resistance, is nothing too interesting to take a look at here. Normal death blow, kind of low stun, 10% bleed resistance. And this is totally thematic for the Bloodsuckers, as most of you have, who have been through the Crimson Court know. Bleed groups are particularly effective there, uh, as well as low trap disarm which makes me think that really this is a comparable class to that of kind of like the Crusader. It's also just something that slithers when it walks. It is not the most agile thing in the world. It is meant to be slow, tanky, and beefy and not something agile. Now we've covered a lot of different transformation classes and the Duchess is no different. She comes out of the stagecoach with all of her abilities unlocked. And as you can expect, she has a transformation ability back here, which will change her from human to beast and back and forth. So that means her first three abilities are her human abilities, and then her second three will be her beast kit. So you don't really have to worry about how you kit her, you just have to worry about how to play her most effectively and the right time to transform her back and forth. And that starts with the first ability in her human kit called Challenger's Reprisal. Challenger's Reprisal is a melee attack in position one or two. It targets enemies in position one or two, an accuracy base 85, a damage modifier of minus 20%, 3% crit modifier. It activates her repost. So this is sort of a bread and butter attack that gets her repost going. It also debuffs herself, minus 40% damage and minus 10% crit. Next in her human kit is Noble Obligation. Noble Obligation is a melee attack that can only be used in position three or four, and it attacks an enemy in the back three ranks. It moves her forward one, has an accuracy base 90, crit modifier 4%, and it debuffs a target for plus crits received. That being very important because her crit buff is to heal herself. So the more she can actually land a crit on something, the more effective she is doing her kind of leech tanking. Now, if this ability feels a little bit familiar to you, it might be because it plays very much like the Crusader's Holy Lance, and that makes sense given that she is kind of a two-handed knight herself, but it really just acts as a nice way to get from the back line forward and land a pretty juicy debuff on an enemy mob. That leaves us with the last ability in her human kit, Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden can be used in any position and it can only be used once per combat. It activates a self buff of 15% prot and minus 10% crits received. So because this is a use per battle one, you can think about popping this off right at the beginning of a boss fight or at a, at a point where she's out of position and she's just taking too much damage. This is her self protective out. Um. 
So now that we have played with her in her human form, it's time to transform her into the beast and figure out exactly what happens when we do so, and that is called Monstrous Affliction. Monstrous Affliction, also usable in any position, can only be used twice per battle, so you really want to be choosy about when you actually bring her in and out of beast form. Upon activation, it buffs herself plus one speed in mode beast, as well as plus 7% damage, but it also debuffs the rest of your party members for plus 10% stress damage received for three rounds. And here's the kicker, when you transform her back to human, you're going to cure bleeds and blights on herself, and then buff the rest of your party to plus 10% stress healing received. So even though you have been they have been taking on the plus stress damage received while she's in beast mode. Now that she goes back to human, they get this nice three round buff of stress healing received to kind of help them catch up and calm down. confluence of skill and purpose. Now that we have finally transformed her into her giant bloodsucker form, the first ability in her kit is Feed the Beast. A melee attack usable in position one or two, this can hit an enemy up to rank three with 80% accuracy, 3% crit modifier. This ability will bypass guard and stealth as well as heal her for three HP. So she really is taking a bite out of somebody here. And this really is kind of the bread and butter aspect of her being sort of a leech and drain tank. Um, the fact that it has a bypass guard here, I think another bit of a little bit more of a nod to her being counter to the bloodsuckers in the Crimson Court, as you tend to run into quite a bit of guard throughout the Crimson Court, but otherwise just a pretty powerful ability and sort of her mainstay for when she's really gonna be tanking. Next in her beast form is Castigate, another melee attack in position one or two that can reach an enemy up to rank three with an accuracy base 90, minus 40% damage modifier, 2% crit modifier, and that is because this is a stun ability that also debuffs an enemy for minus 20% damage. So just nice to have kind of a tail whip here with this leech. Uh, something that will just kind of stun something. You kind of expect maybe a stun to come out of this kind of a knight class. Uh, so definitely really helpful. And the fact that it reaches rank three again makes it fairly powerful. And finally, the last ability in her beast kit is Thirst for Power. Thirst for Power is a ranged attack usable in position one, two, or three. It attacks a single enemy up to rank three. Accuracy base 85, minus 70% damage modifier, 3% crit modifier. And that is because this is a pretty significant debuff. Debuffing an enemy target for minus 25% healing received, minus 6% crit chance, but also very importantly, buffing herself for 20% healing received and 3% crit. So Thirst for Power is just a really great opening ability the second that you transform her early in combat because you not only land this, this pretty decent minus crit buff on an enemy, but more importantly, you're getting that 20% healing received buff and 3% crit just to make her even more of an effective leech tank. So now that we've gone over each individual ability and how she works, let's just talk about general strategy for a second. As I said in the onset of this video, I find her to be really reasonable and sort of practical in basically any dungeon and group. And that is because she doesn't really specialize for bleeds or blights or anything that would be sort of dungeon or enemy dependent. I think it's really important always to point out that whenever you have a character that has a really powerful repost, that you're thinking about the most useful times to activate repost. That is definitely against Crimson Court bosses. That's against enemies that are going to hit, hit, you know, AOE hits, things that have multiple turns, things that are going to guarantee that they're going to hit your character. Repost does very, very well in that, in that instance. Noble Obligation is 
definitely a nice kind of escape tactic if she should be pushed to the back line and you want to get her back up to the front line where she's effective. However, I actually find this to be a nice opener to start her in position three and then push her into position two while landing that debuff of 8% crits received on an enemy sets you right up in position two to use something like Challenger's Reprisal and then just immediately start landing those crits, getting that repost activated. Important to note though, if you transform, you are gonna lose the repost that comes from Challenger's Reprisal. So you wanna either commit to going beast or not, or actually keep her in human form, buffer prot, and, and utilize the repost as much as possible. And again, just pointing out here that when you transform her, you're gonna give your group that 10% stress damage received debuff, but that is countered immediately the time you come back to being human or at the end of battle, you can walk out of there with that plus 10% stress healing received. So sometimes having a stress healer in this group is nice just to help mitigate that, just as you would say maybe an abomination, but also just because the longer she is in her transformation form, the longer she sits in her beast form, she takes just subtle hits of stress each round. Now in terms of her camping kit, she has four unique abilities as you would expect, and they really revolve in a sort of themed around the blood and the curse and being a bloodsucker. And that starts with bloodletting. A time cost one, self only, produces the blood, also removes diseases on her, and suffers 20% of her HP. You can use this three times per camp. So this is pretty cool, right? She is a blood sucker, and so she can just kind of bleed herself, remove a disease in the process, remove some of her health in the process, but will also supply your party with blood should you need it. So next then is self care, time cost three, self only, minus 15 stress and minus 15% stress damage received. This is pretty self-explanatory, but also just keep in mind again that as long as you are in beast form, you're going to be taking little hits of stress at the beginning of every round. And she has no virtue, so affliction is pretty bad. So to manage that, self-care is here. The next then is her most interesting camping ability, the fast, a time cost four, fairly expensive, self only plus three speed, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. Delayed curse craving for the entire quest, as well as immunity to death by the crimson curse for the quest. So the real significance of this here is definitely the plus three speed buff as again, that makes her a much more effective damage dealer and leech tank. To me, the immunity to death by crimson curse is just a purely nod to sort of the theme of her being kind of a bloodsucker here. I don't actually see this coming into play because if you've played it all with the Crimson Curse, you know how damaging wasting really is. You never really want to be wasting in the first place. So to have her just never drink blood and be wasting the entire time doesn't make much sense. And finally, the most valuable of her camping abilities has to be Calling Card, a time cost three, self only plus 10% crit for four battles and two additional healing received for four battles. So this also pretty self-explanatory. This is really how you get her crit up there and how you get her healing ramp going. Now, when it comes to trinketing the Duchess, she has six unique trinkets, all of which are obtained from within the Crimson Court. They each come from three different sets, which mark important parts of her past, present, and possibly future, quote unquote. Uh, so you can definitely find those, and I will link this sheet below the video here, displaying some of their stats, and I believe that these are up to date, but you can tell that all of these, like the basket of heads here, crit multiplier versus any Crimson Court boss, deed to the court, stress healing received in the courtyard. So all of this themed around bloodsuckers and for the most part play within the Crimson Court. It's also worth paying attention to her color of madness trinket. Uh, this being the, there it is, the what was lost, Duchess only, 100% stress healing received from crits and minus 75% healing skills. So if you wanna play her in endless mode and are worried about her stress ramp, you can sort of swap how much stress she heals from crits for how much healing she is and kind of make her a longer sort of sustain class. But in terms of just general trinketing, you know, again, I think you really wanna think about anything that's gonna make her a more effective frontline uh, damage dealing crit monster, right? So you're gonna wanna think about things that buff her accuracy, maybe buff her prod, but ultimately are going to buff her damage and crit. Uh, and then, you know, something like the Ancestor's Candle seems incredibly overpowered, especially because if you play her in the Crimson Court, which I expect you would, you know, you're going to get that, that Torchlight benefit um, across the board. You're gonna get that 15% damage, the two speed, the dodge, etc. And then I think it's really interesting to give her something like a recovery charm 
something that will aid her healing received because this this is also how you're going to really just ramp up her ability to be that leech tank. Every time she lands a crit, every time she uses Feed the Beast, she's gonna be healing herself, and the more of that healing received, the more she's gonna benefit from it. As always, I'll include a link to download and install the Duchess just below the video. And remember that as long as you're playing on PC, it is quite easy to install mods through the Steam Workshop. All you have to do is head over there, find the mod you're looking for, make sure you subscribe to the mod, and then boot the game, and then head over here on the side of your save file to your mod selector, and then make sure that you click in the one that you want. Make sure you pay attention to on the Steam page if any of them require your mod to be loaded in a specific order. And that's gonna do it for this breakdown on the Duchess. And as I mentioned briefly at the start of the video, to thank you guys for being such an awesome community and to celebrate passing 10,000 subscribers here on YouTube, Red Hook is graciously sponsoring a giveaway I'm doing right now, ending November 1st, 2019. Anybody can win, and all you have to do to enter, guys, is subscribe to the YouTube channel and comment below on the video and answer this one simple question. What is it about this game that you really enjoy the most? What is it about Darkest Dungeon that really hits home for you and stands out above other games? And then come the beginning of next month, November 1st, I will randomly select and announce two winners who will get their choice of a Darkest Dungeon diorama, an art book, or one of two t-shirts from the Fangamer merch store. Once I announce the winners, I'll reply to your comment, letting you know that you've won, and all that is required to claim the prize is that you message me directly on Discord so that I can get your information. Simple as that, best of luck. Thanks very much to S Purple, Seal, and an actual bird, IRL, for their generous info and help on this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and make sure to subscribe for more modded content and everything else Darkest Dungeon. And join our community on Discord as we host more contests and giveaways like this in the next coming weeks. And don't forget to follow along on Twitch as we'll be going live again playing a host of new modded classes and having a ton of fun. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next time.